your face before me. Hallo. Hi, hi. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome. I will do this in English, as usual, when we have international guests. Um, my name is Stella Sackingstad. I work here at the Kunsthalle as a curator. Um, and I will just say welcome to this uh, talk. This is the last lecture of 2010 in our lecture series platform uh, at Bergen Kunsthalle. And tonight we are very pleased to have with us um, the art historian David Joslit who will present a talk uh, with the title Painting Stripped Bare, as you can see. Uh, but before I give uh, the mic to David, I just will have a very short introduction just to say a little bit about uh, why we have invited uh, David just at this particular moment. Um, this autumn in Bergen Kunsthalle, we have presented two exhibitions in which uh, painting holds a very particular place. Um, the previous exhibition, a large solo exhibition by Norwegian, Norwegian artist Ida Ekblad. Um, it was sure enough filled mostly with sculptures, but uh, one of her spaces was really filled to, to the brim with, uh, with paintings. Um, all of paint was uh, newly produced by Ekblad in the course of, her, uh, of this very, very productive year of hers in 2010. Um, and when looking at Ida Ekblad's uh, output over the past years, painting has come to fill a very particular position in her art. Um, and I think what's particularly interesting about her paintings is perhaps uh, the way in which they cannot really be separated from uh, her overall uh, very multifaceted practice, which incorporates sculptures and collage, performance, music and poetry. Um, so although her paintings that she showed here looks, her abstract paintings, they look uh, uh, to a certain degree very much like modernist predecessors that uh, we have seen before. Uh, but if we are to really get a grip of these paintings, I think we have to see them in the light of her overall production. And um, so the paintings do not rest only in themselves as uh, autonomous artworks, but need to sort of be seen in relation to a larger picture. And I think the same could be said uh, about most of the works that are on uh, the, the group exhibition uh, currently on display in the Kunsthal, um, with the four artists Nicholas Gambarov, uh, Michael Kreber, R.H. Quaitman and Blake Rain. Uh, this exhibition, more explicitly perhaps than uh, Ida Ekblad's exhibition, places itself within this kind of a current discussion around the medium of painting in contemporary art. And uh, these four artists have been chosen and invited uh, to show together just because of this reason, because they share a certain affinity towards uh, the production of art, uh, and especially because of the way they all, so to speak, filter their whole um, praxis through uh, painting. So one can say that painting constitutes a shared platform around which this exhibition revolves. Uh, even though none of the artists work can very easily be placed in a conventional narrative about painting as a medium, um, they sort of um, filter the practice around the idea of painting or the practice of painting, or the concept of painting. I will not go into any more detail about these exhibitions now, but um, just again, uh, the co one common feature with these two exhibitions, I think, is uh, that the individual paintings that we see never seem to fall to rest within themselves, but always point outwards to various contexts, be it that of the exhibition with that they are placed within, to art history, to their production history, or to a wider network that the paintings inscribe themselves within as circulating objects. And this is uh, something that David Joslin has been uh, touching upon in uh, recent texts. Uh, he has been uh, one very important contributor to the current discourse on contemporary painting. Um, and perhaps it's telling uh, that for these two exhibitions that I have been talking about, uh, Joslit figures as a central reference in both of the publications that accompany these exhibitions. Um, his writing, and especially the essay Painting Beside Itself, that was published uh, in the periodical October last year, 
uh, has already come to be a sort of an important reference uh, uh, text by critics and writers that keeps getting mentioned a lot these days. Um, as a scholar and critic, David Joslett has worked with uh, central periods in modern art, from the Dada movement at the beginning of the 20th century to the growth of globalization and new media in the course of the century. Uh, he is uh, the author of several books on modern art, including Feedback, Television Against Democracy from 2007, and uh, Infinite Regress, Marcel Duchamp, 1910 to 1941, from 1998, both books on MIT Press. Uh, and Joslett has also been active as a curator and scholar since the 80s. He's currently professor of uh, history of art at Yale, and he is the uh, one of the editors of the journal October and writes regularly on, on contemporary art and culture. So, giving a big uh, welcome, David. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's a real pleasure um, to be here uh, and to see this terrific show, which I've just seen for the first time today. So my lecture won't be um, directly addressing it, but it does address, um, in some depth, one of the artists, R.H. Quaitman, in the exhibition, and um, glancingly, but importantly, also Michael Kreber. Um, this, this talk is also an effort, you might be surprised to see, Marcel Duchamp's um, Bride Stripped Bear by her bachelor's even as an opening on a lecture on contemporary painting. And I hope that, it, that soon this will make some sense. Uh, this talk is meant to really pull back from the notions that I tried to introduce around this group of artists, mostly the ones active in New York, um, in, the, in the essay that Steiner mentioned. Um, and to really think about the, the entire sweep of 20th century or modern painting um, with, with these kinds of issues in mind. So, um, so let's begin. Um, conventional wisdom has it that Marcel Duchamp gave up painting for one of two major reasons. First, that it disgusted him, that he found painting a regressive and um, stupid kind of practice and famously um, put down painters as being as smelling of turpentine or being obsessed with the smell of turpentine. So on the one hand, he's thought of as exiting painting because he found it unworthy. And on the other, it's often said that he stopped painting because he wasn't a good painter, um, which is always a, a kind of, I don't know, not terribly um, convincing excuse, but one that, that's often um, put forward. In other words, unlike Picasso, unlike even someone like Juan Gris, his Cubist paintings were not up to snuff, and therefore it forced him out of um, the realm of painting into what we know his, um, him best for. And then, after giving up painting for art, he gave up art for chess. Um, famously, Duchamp uh, has been discussed uh, by Thierry de Duve and others as someone who takes the definition of painting or beauty, um, classically uh, important aesthetic categories, and shifts it to the entire category of art as opposed to the medium uh, of painting or the medium of sculpture for that matter or the medium of photography or whatever.
in a work of art. Um, but in many ways, as we all know, the discourse of the ready-made um, is easily exhausted and has to be constantly reinvented. In other words, once you show a urinal as a work of art, you can't keep showing it and gain the same shock value. And Duchamp himself understood this and learned and developed ways of reissuing and resituating his works throughout his career. But I would argue that there is this other Duchamp that I'm going to focus on today that, that, has, that works on questions of passage that have deeply to do with painting and also deeply to do with how painting now functions for us in 2010. So um, first, let me just define, since I'm taking the term passage um, as an important one, let me define the kind of um, field of meanings that I think it may have and why they are significant to me. First of all, passage suggests um, a physical change of state, a kind of passing, a movement of paint across canvas. So it's a very material kind of movement. Um, you could call it formal. Um, it's absolutely a quality of cubism, but it's also the quality of all painting, virtually, um, of the, how the mark moves across, how its physicality is inscribed in the work. But passage also suggests a kind of movement or motion of the body in this particular painting, um, which has been commented on very frequently, including by myself, but by many others as well, um, as a movement from body to machine. One could say a becoming machine of the body or a becoming body of the machine. What, what is often talked about um, in uh, this work, The Passage from the Virgin to the Bride from 1912, I do think I identified it, but just in case, um, there it is again for you, um, is uh, how certain elements here, um, well, do you have a pointer? Um, oh, I can use my pointer, never mind. I can use the pointer and the, thank you though. Um, how certain elements of the painting are um, often thought of as uh, proto-mechanical or mechanical like machine parts. And yet clearly it seems to be um, some kind of evocation of viscera, of an internal um, system of tendons, of bodily organs, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a way in which passage here is about the passage um, from a state of human locomotion or agency to machine or object locomotion and agency. But finally, there's a very, very interesting um, dimension of passage, which is not unrelated to the one that I just mentioned with regard to this painting. And that goes, where that is hinted at by the title of the work, which again, just to repeat it, is the passage from virgin to bride. Now, of course, the passage from virgin to bride, when you think anthropologically, is the passage of an asset, a family asset or product or a commodity, um, from a father to a groom. Um, and of course, as you know, much of anthropology is based on learning about systems of uh, marriage which move out of and through different community groups. So the passage here is also a passage of property and a passage of a particular kind of property, the property of um, a human woman. Now, um, there are several ways um, that this question of passage uh, moves even further outside of the painting, um, or outside of the work, I should say, in uh, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelor's Even, which is um, also known as Duchamp's Large Glass, which I'm showing you a photograph of now. This work was made over a long period of time from 1915 to 23. And just by the way, I think it's very important to remember that the artist who is um, best known now for choosing something, choosing a ready-made and applying his name to it for this kind of instantaneous displacement of, a, of an object from the realm of commerce to the realm of art. In fact, in, in many of his most important works, including the Etantone, which is now at the Philadelphia Museum, um, worked for many, many years, very slowly, 
and with a kind of perverse, almost perverted form of craftsmanship on those works. I think that's really important to remember um, when we uh, t talk about Duchamp. It may not be as directly relevant to this set of issues, but I think it's something that, um, that I like to say when I show this work. I also would just say that um, I like showing this, uh, this kind of slide of, um, of the glass because it makes it clear that, in fact, it is a work on glass, and light does pass through it. This is its installation um, in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where it currently um, is housed. Maybe some of you have seen it there. Um, but I think it's very important to see the image with the surroundings um, working through it. So there are three, uh, at least three, kinds of passage that um, the large glass um, enables. First, there's passage into space. And here, um, I think this is well known, but um, the top part of the glass, the upper left part, which is known as the bride section, and um, there's a very complicated iconography of this work, which I'll have occasion to talk about from a distance later on in the lecture, but it's not what I'm going to focus on today, which may relieve some of you because it, it's kind of a quicksand that you can get um, quickly lost in. But in any event, that's not my project for the moment. But I do want to point out that on the upper part of the glass is a transposition of this painting that we've been looking at a little bit um, already. And so here we have a passage into space, a passage from a ground which is opaque to a kind of fantasy of groundlessness. In other words, the image no longer has a firm and stable substrate. It's on a piece of glass, and therefore it can be moved. It's, it's in the world in a different way. So passage into space is the first um, way that the glass suggests a kind of um, dynamic of passage. Then the second one I want to propose to you is passage into time. And here is one of those instances of process that I mentioned um, a few moments ago with regard to the crafting of the large glass. This is a beautiful photograph by Man Ray, Duchamp's friend, as you know already, probably from your own knowledge, but also from the picture of them playing chess together. This is a photograph um, that uh, Man Ray took of the bottom part of the large glass, which Duchamp laid flat in his studio for long enough um, so that it would actually collect dust. And then he sealed part of, I'll go back to the part of this. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but it doesn't really matter. I could show you a better slide where you would really see the dust. But in these areas, which are sieves, in other words, kind of filters, um, again, part of a bachelor iconography that I'm not going to go into great detail on, these areas are actually Oh, where did my cursor go? Down here are all sealed versions of that dust that laid on uh, the screen of the work. So I would suggest that Duchamp's work also um, allows for a kind of mobilization of the passage of time, that the work itself is a kind of registration of processes that take different times, that have different time signatures, one could say. And then finally, um, and I do think this list could probably be multiplied, but three's enough for now, I think. Um, the project of the glass um, was uh, also one that led to Duchamp's making various small sculptures um, of windows. And this is the most famous one. It's called Fresh Widow as a pun in English on French window, uh, the kind of full length opening glass doors that uh, we call French windows. Um, and this was, this was titled and made in the US when du Duchamp was there. And it was the first, one of the first works that he signed in his, as his feminine alter ego, ego Eros C'est la Vie. But what I want to suggest about this um, passage to object is that the idea of the glass here becomes a solidified membrane. On the one hand, I talked about glass as a, mom a moment ago as becoming 
groundlessness, a groundless. But here, he allows it to be clotted or blocked. It's a window that is both extracted from a window frame. It's just a window sitting in the middle of nowhere, like almost like a, a kind of um, uh, um, tombstone, you know, um, marking a grave. And um, and its window panes are blocked with um, with uh, black leather. It's also a model. Um, it's not full size. So in several ways, um, the glass passes into object. Um, this is a very different way of thinking um, objectification or reification than uh, the concept of the ready-made, which as we've discussed is the more common one when it comes to Duchamp. What all these operations serve to do is to dislocate various forms of passage from a secure association with the ground. Um, but perhaps the more radical form of passage here um, is a kind of divorce from meaning. What I'm going to argue is that what Duchamp does um, in making this work, um, in pushing the image away from its ground, he also pushes it away from a conceptual ground um, of a secure iconography or concept. In other words, what I'm going to suggest is that Duchamp was the first artist to think about diagram um, and concept as two separate things. And that in the 1960s, what happens is that diagram becomes associated with painting and concept becomes associated with conceptual art. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, what I'm showing you here is um, uh, Duchamp's interesting little work that is made, um, that is part of the kind of general project of the large glass, but is a work that stands alone. It's based on the optical sections um, in the lower part of the glass, down in there. Um, but it stands on its own, and its title is um, To Be Looked At From the Other Side of the Glass With One Eye Close To For Almost an Hour. So what I am suggesting here is that um, this work creates a social diagram and a physical diagram at the same time, but it has no particular iconography or concept um, embedded in it. Um, it's internally consistent, but it has no specific um, signified. Um, what instead it has is a lens which you can actually go behind and look at, and I've done this myself at the Museum of Modern Art, and it's a very powerful experience because when you stand behind a work of art looking out at the people looking at it, it's almost as though you're in the subjectivity of, of the work itself. Um, and so I just ask you to remember that um, when uh, we talk about Yuta Kota in a few minutes because her works are very much um, perform like personages. And in a way, um, that's how, uh, that's the position um, that Duchamp puts the viewer in, in this work. If you go, if you do what he says and look through the lens that's in the center of the picture, of the glass, pardon me, and I'm showing you him on the right looking through it himself or looking at it, um, then you are looking from the perspective of the picture. You are in the picture's eye view, as it were. And you also get to know what it's like to be looked at as a picture. OK. Um, now, what I would like to argue that this is a form of abstraction that's very different from other modernist forms of abstraction. And here I'm going to move very quickly um, just to indicate um, what I think is uh, strikingly different about about this work. So what I would say about the Duchamp is that it is a diagram that is internally consistent but has no external signified. It's a purely abstract diagram. Now, what I would say about Picasso's um, 
uh, violin um, collage from 1912, one of his f famous papier collet where he um, cut the same piece of paper and reversed it. You can see that these at one point fit together and creates a sort of um, perspectival recession through this. This is a very famous instance that is discussed by Rosalind Krauss. Some of you may, if um, you're involved in art history deeply, may know her set of arguments. All I would say about this is that what this work, what Picasso's work, I think, is engaged in is what I'd like to call a kind of semiotic indeterminacy. Um, in other words, how the sign, the meaning of a painted symbol or sign is constantly unstable. So we know it's a violin, we know it's a piece of paper, but what's happening here is that these two are fused together in a system where we're not sure when one shifts or merges into, into the other. So indeterminacy and instability are what Picasso is looking at, not internal consistency and the lack of a signified, which is what I'm suggesting Duchamp is about in this, in this instance. And then just to choose perhaps the most obvious exemplar of what I like to um, call just for clarity when I'm teaching, as opposed to abstraction, non-objectivity. In other words, abstraction can be any um, gesture of simplifying or um, abstracting uh, to make a tautological explanation uh, using the term to explain itself, taking something from one state to a state that is more simplified, let's say, um, less easily legible, et cetera, et cetera. But non-objective suggests a system that is um, fully uh, invented and has completely its own um, set of terms. And of course, that's what Mondrian did with his system of um, black perpendiculars and primary colors plus black and gray, of which I'm showing you just a fairly random early example, a uh, composition with red, blue, black, yellow, and gray from 1921. Now, what I would argue is that, yes, both of these works are um, non-objective, in my view. However, Mondrian's work is aimed toward a compositional balance, which he, if you're interested in his writings, he associated with the male and the female, the active and the passive. We don't have to buy all that. It's not really relevant for this discussion. The point is that it's a system that had a built-in balance. And what I'm trying to suggest is that Duchamp's diagrams, while internally consistent, are not compositionally balanced. Because, in fact, this work is a fragment it's a tool, it's a device for looking in a museum to be looked at for the other side, from the other side for nearly an hour. This is part of how Duchamp breaks apart the diagrammatic image and the concept, or we could say in a more old fashioned way, the iconography of a work of art. Um, and here, I think, is the crux of one of the most important things he does for the 20th century um, that, that is parallel to uh, his great importance in terms of inventing the ready-made. And that is, um, he brings the explanation of the work out from behind the work as a supporting factor and makes it autonomous. Now, what does that mean? On the right, I'm showing you um, what's also called uh, the Bride Strip Bear by her bachelor's even, um, but it's referred to as the green box. And what it is, is a very carefully reprinted, reproduced set of Duchamp's own notes about the large glass. Now, I just want to make it clear that he went to great efforts to take little, if you think of your own, you know, doodles and scraps and notes on little bits of scrap paper. that He had some version of that, but he was very careful to make metal plates that absolutely followed those configurations. So for better or worse, it was a kind of um, insane or very deeply um, craftsman-like act of, um, of reproduction. But what these 
what he is doing through this is he's taking the notes which explain the very complicated drama that I've alluded to several times and will still not um, describe to you because I think it takes us down a, a digression we don't need to go. But basically what's happening here is very similar to the passage um, from Virgin to Bride. There's a notion of an encounter between a geometricized male register below and a female register above, which is more organic. And there is a kind of picaresque um, uh, epic that Duchamp's own notes project onto this work. But we would never, ever, ever know that this is what it meant if we didn't have the artist's um, notes. And what's really interesting is that the artist's notes themselves were made into a work. Um, so the difference between a meaning, which stands in a supporting role behind the diagram of the painting, and um, and the diagram itself um, is therefore broken apart. What I'd like to argue through this duality of the green box and the large glass is that they're both works with their own itinerary, their own set of meanings, and their own kind of um, independence. And therefore, the relation between the diagram and the concept is no longer one of, um, of self-mirroring. The meaning and the, the image are no longer tied together in any kind of inherent way. They go off in their own paths as independent players. Now, um, this is why I think that Duchamp stripped um, painting bare. Um, because uh, I think he came to the realization that the image and its meaning were autonomous discourses that could part from one another and have their own manifestations. Now, if you think about it, that's exactly what the ready-made does by other means. Um, but this particular genealogy helps us with, um, with the story that we're interested in tonight, which is that of contemporary painting. Um, now, I think that Duchamp's exit to chess, to use a kind of pun, um, well, I, first of all, I don't believe in his exit to chess, but let's say he did. I mean, he certainly did play it, and he certainly brought his career as an artist underground to many degrees, though he by no means ended it. Um, so chess, though, for him, may have been the acknowledgement, and this is fanciful, this is purely a metaphor, really. I don't, I don't claim any real um, archival proof for this, but that it was um, the manifestation of a stalemate that he had taught himself in terms of these, the content and the diagram diverging. He had stripped them bare um, in this division but he didn't know where to go from there. <coughs> and in fact, there is a little bit of archival evidence that I'll just mention in my own um, behalf and then move on from this. His book that he wrote on, on chess with a partner who was also a chess expert, which is a very interesting project, um, in its design, et cetera. I won't go into it at the moment. But it was about a very specific form of endgame where you get stuck. So I think he was very interested. It's, it was basically a kind of endgame where there were no moves, no possible moves. And how do you, how do you get out of it? How do you deal with it? Um, OK. Now, all of this really is leading for me to this notion of how by, let's say, 1970 or so. Um, we could argue with the date, but I think it's of no real importance for the purposes today. That, in fact, what Duchamp had showed as possible had become the fact of, of, of modern art. Or if you want to call it postmodern art, that's fine, too. Um, and here I'm just showing you um, a work by Lawrence Wiener to um, 
it, it's not it's kind of an imperfect slide to show this, but but I can explain it. I think it might be familiar to many of you. It's a work that exists both in text and in action, and it's called Two Minutes of Spray Paint Directly Upon the Floor from a Standard Aerosol Can from 1968. Now, famously, um, Wiener declared the following about each of his works of art. One, the artist may construct the work. Two, the, the work may be fabricated. Three, the work need not be built. Each being equal and consistent with the intent of the artist, the decision as to the condition rests with the receiver upon the occasion of receivership. So the receiver would be the museum or the collector. And there's a famous story told about Wiener, which I think is true, that the first um, person to put one of his texts on the wall, which before had been published in books, um, was actually a collector, um, Count Panza, who said, well, you know, I would like to display this. And he said, well, you can. You know, this is how you can do it. So, um, so I'm not absolutely sure that's true, but it's a story often told. Um, the point is that this work is, you know, is documented. And at one point, he made the perfect abstract diagram of a painting, a commodity of spray paint pressed until that thing was a puddle on the floor, as you see on the right. And then he made the absolute form of the concept by making the text equivalent to the act. So what I'm suggesting here is that, in a way, this division that we saw in Duchamp already is the division which carries us from, let's say, 1968 to the 80s. And that the moment that we're in now is the moment when painters overcome this particular stalemate. But let me just say a little bit, show you a little bit more by what I mean by this stalemate. First of all, I like this, um, <coughs> this slide because it's both a documentation of a painting and, and the kind of um, launching of a question. It's a work, it's a painting by John Baldessari, which you'll not be surprised is titled What is Painting from 1966 to 68, whereas you can see he writes, um, do you sense how all the parts of a good picture are involved with each other, not just placed side by side? Art is a creation for the eye and can only be hinted at with words. But of course, what he's doing is, um, is presenting words. So here, here is the kind of uh, late 60s um, definition of the stalemate. He's saying, on the one hand, language is inadequate, but that's what he's giving you. Now, let me just give you, I'm going to give the shortest possible um, summary of this, because I think, in a way, this history is very familiar. But in the 70s, much of radical painting was deeply diagrammatic. And what's interesting here is that um, painting in the expanded field, a work by Daniel Buren, his painting sculpture from the Guggenheim International in 1971, which is on the left, was famously a form of institutional critique where he used his awning painting, uh, awning fabric, in various ways to indicate the position of painting culturally and socially. And here, he blocks the atrium of the Guggenheim Museum. So painting becomes an obstruction. So on the one hand, the diagram is made pure as a social entity. But on the right is um, Frank Stella's um, Salt, uh, Lake City from 1970, which is a shaped canvas, by the way. It's not, um, there's no white section in the middle of it. It is the sort of U shape, is the shape of the canvas itself, where, um, where his work becomes um, uh, fully diagrammatic in a way that it does not have the social critique dimension that Stellis does. Now, from the perspective of text, um, there are many, many examples as well. Um, I'm just showing you Hanna Darboven, 19 number drawings from 1973, where text becomes pictorial on some level, where a, sometimes she uses nonsense language, sometimes she uses numbers. And on the right um, is Marcel Broter's uh, Cinema Model from 1970, which is a vacuform sign where these kind of commas become almost, oh, I don't know what, you know, 
ghost figures or something. We could talk a lot about this, obviously. But my point here is that the diagram um, and the text move, are stripped bare, are thought about ontologically during this period. <coughs> but this stalemate um, was one, I think, that artists began to feel in the 80s, and which caused the change in painting that the show you have here um, ultimately uh, develops. Um, or works through, as, as, um, as I'd like to argue. Um, <clears throat> what I'd first like to argue, which I think is a really, for me, is a very useful intervention, is to take a term from, from the digital worlds that we live in, formatting. You format a photograph in different ways. We all format documents in different ways. Most of you are younger than I am and are probably formatting videos and unknown things to me in different ways. But a format suggests um, virtually infinite capabilities to redirect content, to resituate content, whereas a medium suggests a set of material and conceptual conventions that persist over time. So this is a little bit of a stacked deck, but I think it's helpful to think about it. If you think about the medium as a road, I mean, this is a winding road, so it's not just a you know, straight, um, restrictive road, but, but you have to stay within the terms of a medium for it to be recognized as a medium. Whereas a format could be thought of as a, as a kind of freeway interchange, where several things, um, where a point of exchange or node, nodal situation occurs. And um, so what I'd like to argue with the, the remaining minutes that I have and about the artists, um, well, some artists who, who come before and the sort of artists of this moment that Steiner has brought together for you um, is that these artists, uh, by formatting instead of working with medium, end up bringing painting into life. And what that means is that they do a form of bare painting. And I'll explain, um, those of you who, who are readers of Giorgio Agamben know already what I might mean by that, the important Italian philosopher whose concept of bare life has been very, very influential in recent years. But first, let me just give you an example from the 80s of what this kind of formatting of painting might mean. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cold, as you can tell. I'm sorry about that, but I'll try to keep the coughing to a minimum. Um, on the left is a uh, a very well-known work by Sherry Levine called After Vincent Van Gogh from 1983, where she copies a, an already a reproduction of a, Vince, Vince, a famous Vincent Van Gogh self-portrait from, I believe, 19, uh, 1889, and makes it her own miniature um, reproduction. And on the right is, um, is Alan McCollum's work, um, sorry, uh, surrogates in its installation of 1983. And each one of these little paintings, for those of you who don't know uh, McCombs' work, are kind of ceramic-like um, painting avatars. They're just blank uh, black with frames around them in different sizes that are usually um, exhibited in a profusion. So <coughs> what I want to argue here, um, there's much that can be said about these works, but I'm going to say, make one point about each one of them. The first is, on the left, I'm calling this vertical connection or vertical integration. Um, do you, it, perhaps some of you know the term vertical integration. It refers to companies that, let's say you're a company that makes computers, so you buy a company that, um, that uh, does software and also um, uh, produces chips. So in other words, all of the different aspects of the endeavor of your, of your business are vertically integrated within the same institution uh, or organization, corporation. What I'm suggesting here is that what Sherry Levine has done is incorporate 
um, uh, a great artist, the reproduction of the great artist, the dilemma of an artist coming after that artist, and the brilliant concept of Sherry Levine, younger artist, to appropriate the work itself. In other words, these are all layered. I mean, this is just, you know, a watercolor. But what happens is that that watercolor brings those relations into itself, and I'd call that a form of vertical connection. The horizontal connection is more self-evident. Obviously, McCollum is talking already in 1983. There's experiences of image explosions even, um, even before the internet 10 years later creates a real internet, a uh, real image explosion. And here he's suggesting that what painting does is it just, it, it multiplies, it, it spreads like a fungus or a virus. Now let me just say something about Agamben's idea of bare life. Um, Agamben locates power's grip on life in the erasure of difference between the citizen, which he sees as a legal entity, and the body as a purely biological organism. And this is really very important. The citizen is someone with legal rights. Um, her or his personal life is irrelevant. The body, of course, is a very different kind of object of power. Um, while classical political theory is grounded in the difference between civic life and what Agamben calls bare or naked life, this difference erodes in the course of the 20th century, according to him, and I think according to many philosophers, Michel Foucault and others, of course, you can, we can name na several, several, um, to the point where the state attempts to inscribe itself directly into the biological being of its subjects. Such a seizure of bare life is evident in the struggles around abortion rights, euthanasia, and the right of gay and lesbian people to marry, which have become central issues in my country. And I'm sure there are examples I'm less aware of here and other parts of the world that are equally um, vivid. The point here is that what I would like to argue is that bare painting is a suspension of painting as a medium. It's a kind of state of emergency of the medium of painting and a reformatting as a configuration within life. It's a way of taking the content of painting, and that can be very many different things, and reformatting it. So I, I'm, um, and here I would just summarize this by saying that when the content of painting goes from medium to format, the result is bare painting. Um, and I'm gonna give, uh, as I close, I'm gonna show, um, talk about two examples of works that I know well and that I've written about, but in the context of this broader framework. Um, the first is um, Yuta Coter's work in New York, um, Lux Interior, which was um, uh, um, an exhibition that was at the Rena Spallings Gallery in downtown New York uh, last year in 2009. <coughs> the exhibition was centered on a single work that acted as a personage. Um, it's very important to realize that this screen on which it stands stepped on and off the platform that the that the, um, that the gallery has. This is just the way the gallery is. It's in a, a kind of Chinatown location um, in downtown New York. It's not a fancy, you know, it's not fancy art world space. Um, well, it's, a, it's very much an art world space, but not a fancy one. Um, and you can see here on the left side, this is an old light that was taken from a very famous New York gay nightclub that shines onto the painting. And Coter performed with it um, several times during the course of um, of her uh, of the show, uh, and during her performance with it, there was a strobe light set up. So it was almost like a kind of she she was basically dancing with or performing with the painting, as though it were a kind of personage. The canvas itself is called um, Hot Rod after Poussin, and it is a reworking of Poussin's landscape with Pyramus and Thisbe from 1651, which is a kind of Romeo and Juliet type love story where um, Pyramus uh, 
two lovers go to meet in the countryside. Um, the guy sees the, the, the woman's um, veil uh, chewed up and assumes that she's been killed by a lion. So he kills himself in despair. Then, of course, she comes back. She's, she was only chased away by the lion. And she kills herself in despair. So it's a tragic story. Um, but it's also a beautiful work of Poussin that's been written about at length by T.J. Clark. And so um, Coter takes this work and uses it, passes from its historical moment to the present to create this kind of vivid red, almost visceral. It's not unlike, I think, the bride um, painting of Duchamp that I started my, my talk with in terms of the strange sense of of a kind of inside of a body that it um, that it gives. So, what I want to suggest here then is that the passage inside the painting moves is linked in intimately to passages outside the painting. That the painting becomes an actor, and that the painter isn't just the maker of the work but an interlocutor on some level, someone who's, you know, who's literally on equal terms with it um, as a companion, not unlike um, the way that Duchamp made um, content and, um, and diagrams separate. So I just wanted to suggest that Coter, who also works with glass in very interesting ways, some of you may have seen her show at the Von Abba Museum, and actually there's going to be a, um, a, a retrospective in Stockholm in the spring that I recommend if, if you can make it. It's not too far, I guess, from here. Anyway, that, um, that her use of the painting as a kind of screen, as a performer, um, as a an object around which passage can occur both within the frame of the work and outside of it performative, performatively um, allows it to pass into life. Now the second example um, is drawn from another show in New York that I was able to see several times and get to know well. And this is Rebecca Quaitman or um, R.H. Quaitman's um, work uh, in an exhibition um, called From One O to the Other at the Orchard Gallery, also in the Lower East Side of New York uh, from 2008. And um, this exhibition included uh, collaborative work from a critic, Rhea Anastas, um, as well as the painter, Amy Silman. And um, both of their works had very strong archival dimensions. Uh, um, and Anastas' work, uh, had a series of clippings from the gallery, and Silman's were portraits, quick portraits of members of the gallery and their friends that were laid out on a table for people to look through, so they weren't preciously put up. But what I want to focus on is how Quaitman, um, who made a chapter, as she did, did here in Bergen, chapter 10, a Asof, Asof, from 2008, um, took the space of the building. Here you can see, and also here, and here in its window, which was a gentrifying building in a neighborhood that changed dramatically in the three years that the gallery was there. It went from being basically a kind of um, wholesale clothing and pretty um, ungentrified neighborhood to being a place where now there are lots of galleries. So. Um, Quaitman's work uh, always takes the surface of the painting as an occasion to direct one's gaze outside of the painting. Um, there's a passage from the work to the environment of the gallery, but then beyond the environment of the gallery to the neighborhood in which it exists. Um, and I think that's true in her work here in this exhibition, um, where she really comments, I think, on the group of three other artists, all men, with whom she's exhibiting. Um, one final thing I'll say about this to, to kind of um, 
build up to my concluding remark, and this is not as, whoops, this is not as clear in these images, but if you've seen uh, the Quaitmans in the show, you know that she creates a very strong optical roster on top of her paintings that often actually hurt the eyes. And I think that this is a very interesting way of making the surface of the painting deflective. In other words, it pushes you out of the painting into somewhere else. Its object status does that too. And its quality as an archive. Because what, <coughs> it's almost as though Quaitman is creating a set of books um, that are paintings. <coughs> These two kinds of surfaces ultimately <clears throat> refer one to the space beyond. The passages internal to the painting lead to those that are external to it. And this is what I've called in the article that Steiner mentioned, transitive painting, that the passages within a work link with passages outside. It's not that art goes into life, but art becomes life, bare life, through making itself an actor in a set of passages, um, as well as a registration of these passages on its own form. The best account I know of this is in Merlin Carpenter's various comments on framing in his very well-known and often quoted essay from 2000 um, on Michael Kreber. And here uh, I gave you a, a quick preview of this when I um, made the mistake of putting it up a second ago. This is, again, um, a work that was exhibited in New York of Kreber's, uh, one of several um, windboards that he cut up into units and uh, gave as almost a kind of serial um, set of forms. <clears throat> this one is called Bruce Jones, 2008, which is after um, a famous windboarder. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of these quotes uh, by way of finishing from, um, which is interesting because it's kind of what Adam Kleinman did as well. Um, I had done this before I read his essay in the catalog. He quotes some of the same, but the, the one that is most important to me, he actually doesn't, as I remember, quote. Um, so Merlin Carpenter writes, painting is a real subject matter, but is it really possible to stay within the frame when the frame constitutes such a massive question? So the question of painting then, we could say, the formatting question is where and what is a frame? Then he says, working inside a frame that contains nothing. So again, the primacy of the frame is opposed to the work. But this is the quote that really, for me, is the most useful lately for really conceptualizing um, these strategies. What is within the frame feels like it is stretched so taut that it allows no access. One tends to immediately bounce off into the world outside, unquote. So in other words, the painting creates, is almost like a drum which bounces you off. We think of painting as um, drawing us in, right? Of creating a virtual space. But all of these paintings, all of this work that we're um, puzzling through now, bounces you back um, into the world. And that, in the end, is what I think the difference is between bear painting and painting strip bear. So thank you very much. And I don't know if you do questions, but I'm happy to if that's part of the, <coughs> part of the drill here. Hi. Um. Thank you very, very much for a really great and inspiring lecture. And uh, yes, we do questions, so I can um, run around with the mic if anyone has um, something to ask. Yes. Integrates the, the left, yeah, it's an outside piece that's on the floor. There's a, there's a little, little uh, wall. Oh, do you mean this, yeah. this step? To the right, the wall. Okay. The wall piece. 
Uh, oh, that's behind the painting? That, behind the painting. that holds the painting. Okay. That's the one you mean? But, yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. It just, it just seems that she's actually, on, on the one hand, she's got one leg outside the gallery right. space, but she's actually extracting the gallery space outside as well. It's not only that the painting is on, on the way in, but it's also on the way out. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree with you. And one thing that, um, by looking, you know, when you see something live, you, I mean, this is a total banality and truism, but you, you always see things that are, that are harder to see in an image. So it may have not been as clear to you. I'm just trying to, I think maybe in this one, it's clearer that the screen is actually shorter as well as wider than the painting itself. So you can sort of see here that it's almost as like it's, it's hair, <laughs> um, the back of his head, it, its head, not his head. It sounded like I'd said his. Um, you can sort of see that here too, but it's a little hard because of the wall. See, this is the screen and the white wall behind. So I think that this lack of fit between what the painting's on and the painting itself gives the painting, which she does a lot. I mean, she did um, a piece in Graz recently in Austria where um, she did a kind of um, bus shelter where there were paintings on both sides and they were mismatched in terms of size. So sometimes you would see the back of the painting and sometimes you would see the front. And I think that it's a, I think it's a way, and here I'm just, I haven't sorted it completely out for myself, so I'd be curious to hear what you have to say, but. I think it's a way of her making clear that the painting is in the round, that it has a kind of body that includes a back. And when she uses glass, um, this is very important um, because you can actually see glass as a, a surface for installing works. You can see both sides of them. And then sometimes works are installed. Let's say there's one on the recto and you can see the verso through the glass, but there may also be a work that's installed on, on top of what you see as the back of this one. I know that's confusing, right? But do you get what I mean? So that it's, it's as though if, um, <clears throat> if this were glass, you could see the whole back of that painting, but then she might put another painting there. So you sort of, so there, so, I think what she wants to do, or what she's doing, is suggesting that the painting is in the round, is a body, has entered into space in a very important way, but also it stays rooted to being something that is on a wall, you know, that, that hangs. I think it's fascinating, actually, that it both has to keep hanging and it has to show that that's not all it is somehow, or that it's a body hanging. I don't know, what do you think? Do you have ideas about that? I think, uh, <coughs> I think it's uh, pretty obvious that it seems what painting is. Uh, no, I just think it's more obvious uh, when you see the wall that it functions more as a painting than, than a sculpture. Mm -hmm. if, it was, if it was lacking the wall, then I guess you would still see it as a painting, uh, perhaps, but it's it's more a function in the gallery spaces because she's actually drawing Rena Spalling's wall to her object. Right, right. And pulling I mean, it outside in a way. The thing that's really interesting about these artists, you know, this kind of field of people who are thinking about painting in ways that you know, feel kind of different, I guess, to many people, is um, that they don't want to give up painting, which is something that earlier generations of, let's say, radical or serious or avant-garde painters, it was constantly about, you know, the destruction of the painting, the end game of the painting, the sort of degree zero of painting. But that isn't this strategy. It's almost as though we're, we're, that's a given, that's a vocabulary to play with. And so it's more like how can a painting be a vehicle, you know, to get you from, you know, 
from in there to out here, or vice versa, as you put it. <clears throat> More questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I have to just confess that I I'm, don't really know what I'm asking. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> But I felt I felt um, prompted a little bit just to maybe respond to your to your reference to, to the notion of bare life, uh -huh. and um, I just kind of maybe wondered if you could explore that more <clears throat> in relationship to the political. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know it's not something that you're kind of maybe aiming for this evening, mm -hmm. um, but I, um, again, it sort of struck me, and I'm just intuitively wanted to to ask that if you had any thoughts about about that more directly? Right. Well, I think that um, in terms of the political, the concept of bare life is extremely important because what it um, suggests is that civil society needs to, there, um, there are new subjects that don't register within political accountings such as the refugee, for instance, or, I mean, um, Agamben talks a lot about camps uh, in the sense of refugee camps or concentration camps where, um, and um, I think that refugees, migrant workers, um, subjects that are transnational and don't have a secure um, point from which to make demands for rights are precisely those subjects who are most vulnerable to the kind of power that he's that he's talking about? And there, you know, there's no example. I pardon me. It's no um, coincidence that he talks about camps. But the fact is that um, power and pleasure are also derived from more privileged subjects um, through uh, addressing a different level of our experience, which I would say, you know, the, the kind of um, person as, as biological entity as opposed to, um, to uh, uh, the citizen, the person as a kind of political concept, as a, as a political abstraction. And so from that point of view, I think a lot of, I mean, I actually think that, um, you know, and, and I'm on safer ground in, you know, in my own national context, but you know, there are a lot of questions around um, food and um, drugs uh, and health care um, that become really primary in the sense that um, uh, Americans uh, take a lot of drugs, which are very expensive. And I don't mean Ill illegal drugs. I mean, they're medicated. We are medicated. And, um, and it's a huge industry. And it's a way of kind of producing a certain kind of consent as well, and producing a certain kind of easy solution to life decisions, which I think have manifestations beyond that. I mean, I believe you know in drugs when they're necessary, but I think that there's an ethos of um, making a problem and then fixing a problem. And I think that these bio um, areas, you know, there have been new health standards around fatty foods and. Healthcare is the biggest problem in our country now, in in many ways, uh, politically, because it's sort of impossible um, to expand it without being accused of expanding government. So this kind of interface between a body and a government, um, what a citizen, I mean, it's a real debate over if a citizen is someone who has a body that needs to be cared for. So I think there are enormous political stakes, um, as I, kind of assume you would assume as well. And I don't think that they're irrelevant to the works that I'm, um, that I'm talking about. I mean, I think especially someone like Coter, I mean, this would take, I, I'm not sure I'm going to give a convincing um, answer to that right at the moment, but um, there is a way in which uh, the painting becomes a kind of the surface of the painting becomes a body in a, in a very visceral and, um, and kind of affecting way uh, that is subject to, to various kinds of actions that I think, um, you know, that I think is connected to these different, these different concerns. 
but I'm not, I'm not doing too well at doing it, so I'm going to stop right now. Thank you. I'll beg sympathy because I did come directly from the United States, which isn't so easy as it turns out. But. More questions? No, I think we'll okay. end there then. Oh, oh. There's, there's one. <laughs> well, I'm just grabbing this chance since there were no other questions. Um, and you just said that you came directly from the US. Uh -huh. um, if you'd like to, would you please comment on the whole um, censorship issue that is so do you mean so the sad. WikiLeaks? No, no, <laughs> no. The portrait galleries um, censoring that video. You know, I did not. I don't know about it. You didn't. It. Oh, okay, okay. Will you tell okay, me about I'm it? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. But I'm ashamed that I don't even know what you're well, talking about. Well, there is about. this hide seek show at the National Portrait Gallery. Oh, right. I know about that show. Yeah. Um, and there was a video um, that was taken out of it the other day. Uh -huh. um, because of right-wing, um, conservative Catholics uh -huh. reacting to some content that um, it was crucifix with uh -huh. some bugs on it. Uh -huh. So, but if you're not informed, I just I just thought I could get no, a fresh perspective from well, from. I yeah. mean, it sounds typical. <laughs> Somebody who'd probably care. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that specific case, but it's it's a pretty common narrative, sadly, mm -hmm. which is, um, it's very interesting, actually, when you think about this, because the way it works, as you probably know, is that the criticism comes from the fact that it's tax dollars, that it's a kind of collective mm -hmm. civil mm -hmm. fund that is being applied to speech which offends mm. usually religion or heterosexuality set, tend to be the big, you know, um, things that are vulnerable to to um, to these works of art in, in their view. And it's um, it's a really um, it's actually I mean it kind of goes back to the bare life question because the the arts funding in the United States public arts funding is incredibly low. Um, it's low. I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's low as a number, and it's low given how large a, c a country we are and how affluent in, in some ways we are. And so it's a fascinating um, effort to um, enclose what can, or to limit what can be thought of as illicit public expenditure. Um, and um, and it's actually really, really bad. I mean, I think it's related to the question of, of health care, for instance, which is also not considered um, what the public should be doing. Um, it, it's, it should remain private. I mean, here is this kind of perverted version of the bare life, you know, dynamic in a certain in a certain sense. So I'll have to go online and find out about this. I'm sorry to not, to not have the information, but it's, you know, there have been a lot of these since the 80s, you know, these kind of panics around. Yeah, there was the Mapplethorpe thing. Yeah, the, and the Serrano. There were a whole the series of well. them mm. that basically succeeded in undermining the National Endowment for the Arts in the United mm -hmm. States yeah. and making it no longer really a viable, mm. um, you know, place like the Kunsthalle here would uh, unlikely get much support from it now mm. because of what happened then to kind of um, limit the brief of what is considered a, a kind of public good. Yeah. And, and maybe some, some donator would had uh, threatened to, to pull away his funds and 
I Maybe guess I think it's more, on that. I think in Washington, D.C., they're very, very sensitive because a lot of these, mm. you know, for instance, the Maplethorpe thing happened in Washington. Mm. And it's because, you know, the senators are all there, the media, the, I mean, the politicians are all there, the media is all there. Mm. You know, it's kind of this real centralized, you know, scandal um, cooker. Mm. You know, you can just... It's easy <laughs> to yeah. make it happen there, you know. So I th and mm -hmm. I think you know they're funded. These are national museums. They're funded by Congress. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, they, I think, they feel especially vulnerable. Mm. Okay. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. One last chance then. <laughs> Okay, thank okay. you. Sure. Very much, thank you. <laughs>